Welcome, my friends, to Inside the Minds of Authors. I'm Daisy Gomez, and I'm thrilled you're joining me today for a fun conversation with a passionate author. We're kicking off the program like it's our tradition with a short reading from the feature book. I hope you guys enjoy it. Let's get started. Uh, hi, my name is Tom Morrison. I'm a retired New York City lawyer. I spent 45 years trying cases and arguing appeals around the country. In my retirement, I've taken up writing satirical novels about lawyers. My forthcoming book, Send in the Tort Lawyers, is the third in a series of farces about modern American litigation. Every character in all the books, lawyers, clients, judges, are satirized and every lawsuit filed by the protagonists, twin brothers, Pap and Pup Peters, take on amusing, if not bizarre, turns. I'm going to read from chapter 11 in the forthcoming book. The plaintiff in one of the new cases, a case involving currency firm that went into bankruptcy virtually overnight, she's having her deposition taken by a lawyer named Holly Woods, a celebrity lawyer from Los Angeles who is representing the celebrity defendants in that case. And here is the opening Q&A sequence in her deposition. Question, state your full name for the record. Answer, Dr. Irene, good night. Question, what is your profession? I'm a sleep doctor. What does the sleep doctor do? We help people who have trouble sleeping. Do you need some sort of medical degree to do that? Well, there are all kinds of people who hold themselves out as sleep doctors. Some are psychologists, but many are doctors. I'm one of them. So you've actually gone to medical school? Of course, how else could I be a doctor? Do you have some sort of certification? Yes, I'm board certified by the American Board of Sleep Medicine. I didn't know there was such a board. Well, there is. Who else could certify sleep doctors? I'll ask the questions. That's the way it works. I hope your counsel explained that to you. He did. Let's move on. Where is your practice located? Answer, in my husband's building in Scarsdale. Who's your husband? Mr. Goodnight. What's his full name? Joffrey Goodnight. Question, and he owns an office building in Scarsdale? Well, it's actually a funeral home. Your husband owns a funeral home? Yes, he's an undertaker. You can't be an undertaker unless you have a funeral home. What's the name of the funeral home? The Long Goodnight Funeral Home. Lengthy pause. So are you saying that your office for your sleep practice is in the Long Goodnight Funeral Home? Yes, why is that? Well, when we were first married, Joffrey only had a small funeral home in Hartsdale so I had my office in our house. Question, so now in the Long Goodnight Funeral Home, you have a larger space? Yes, the funeral home is quite large with lots of rooms, so it can accommodate numerous people at the same time. By quote, accommodate numerous people at the same time, you mean you can have several corpses in there at the same time? Yes, dead bodies and caskets, each one gets a separate room. What about your patients? Isn't it creepy for them to come to a funeral home to see a doctor about a sleep disorder? Oh no, quite the contrary. In fact, Mr. Goodnight and I view it as sort of a dual service. If you need help getting a good night's sleep, you make an appointment with me. If you want help with a longer kind of sleep, you make an appointment with him. We also get a lot of cross referrals. People who come to see me sometimes wind up needing to see him. And families who come to see him frequently need help from me after they're done with him. Question, I assume that business has been good for both of you, good enough that you've accumulated enough money to take up investing in cryptocurrency? Well, Joffrey's business is the one that's really booming. You mean there's been an uptick in deaths in Scarsdale, perhaps because of COVID? No, it's not that. It's the fact that the Long Good Night Funeral Home is the first funeral home in New York State to offer human composting. What's that? 
It's an eco-friendly form of burial. It reduces carbon emissions. And now it's legal in New York and five or six other states. How does it work? You sure you wanna know? I just asked you, didn't I? Well, you start by taking the body out of the casket after the funeral, of course. You put it in a large vessel. It's sort of a box and it's filled with organic material such as straw, alfalfa, and sawdust. The box is then sealed and attached to a heating system while the remains gradually decompose. Usually takes about 30 to 60 days. You have to keep opening the box to check. At the end of that time, the contents are removed and screened. Inorganic material, such as bones, are separated and placed back into the box for another 30 days or so. At the end, you have no body, no bones, just two nice piles of compost. What do you do with the compost? Answer, we give it back to the family in a nice big plastic container. You generally get about a cubic yard of compost per body. That's equivalent to maybe 30 bags of topsoil. You can use it to enrich the soil in your garden. The deposition then goes on to deal with Dr. Goodnight's investment in the failed cryptocurrency firm which is the subject one of one of the several lawsuits discussed in this new novel. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Inside the Minds of Authors. I'm your host, DC, and I'm so thrilled you guys are joining us today. I really hope you had as much fun with this reading as I did, because I am going, oh my God, oh my God, what's going on? But remember, it's going to be a blast. I'm, I'm so glad you guys are joining us. If you're new to the podcast, go ahead and subscribe. You don't want to miss a single episode. We're here with new authors every Monday, so you don't want to miss all the fun. If you're interested in supporting the community even more, join the Patreon community. Give our authors some love. Help us to bring more to the airway. So we're looking forward. But you guys are here to learn about our authors, so I can't wait. Hello, Mr. Tom. How are you? I'm fine, DC. How are you? I am giggling and cringing and all that fun stuff that authors bring to the page. So thank Terrific. you. I need to know. I have questions. What can I say? First of all, congratulations. Your fourth novel. Congratulations on retirement. This is awesome. What made you decide to start writing after you retired? Well, I've always loved novels and I always wanted to write a novel. And in fact, I spent four years in the US Air Force after law school. During that time, I wrote what I considered to be a spy novel. Luckily, the publishers I sent it to all rejected it and it never saw the light of day. Fast forward 45 years, during my final year of practice, I started thinking once again, it really would be fun to write a novel. This time though, I decided I ought to write about something I knew about, namely modern American litigation. What did I know about spy novels other than what I saw on television or in the movies? So I decided to write a novel about modern American litigation. I didn't want to write a legal thriller. I think they're kind of a dime a dozen. I didn't want to write a serious book about law. Nobody would read it. But I've always felt after participating in litigation for 45 years around the country, there's a lot of humor in the law, and an awful lot of lawyers take themselves way too seriously. So it occurred to me that what I really wanted to write was a farce about modern American litigation. My model was Joseph Heller's Catch-22, which was a farce about the Army Air Corps during World War II. I read that novel 50 years ago on my way to Korea when I was in the Air Force, and I marveled at the way Heller turned every encounter, every character, every bit of dialogue into farce. And so that was what I was attempting to do with my torts books. I love it. I got to say, it was extremely entertaining and yet so witty, but I need to know, is the format of the book a whole bunch of anecdotes? Do you have a case that they're trying to investigate? How does this work? Give us a well, little more on what am I listening to? Sure. The first book uh, in the series, Torts R Us, introduced the protagonists, Pap and Pup Peters, twin brothers. They leave their big firm, blue chip law practices to start up a plaintiff's class action firm, thinking that they can make more money and have more fun. And it turns out they were correct. 
Now, in the first third of that first book, I delved into the background of Papp and Pup before they formed their class action firm. The cases that they dealt with at their prior firms were all riffs on cases that I personally handled during my years practicing law. Once they went and formed the class action firm, I never did class action litigation. None of the class action cases in any of the books are based on my own cases. However, every single case discussed and played with in each of the books has a real life antecedent. You would be amazed at the number of things that people bring lawsuits about and class actions about. So every case that you will encounter in any of these books, including the cryptocurrency case that I just read from, have an analog in a real life class action case. I'm amazed at the fact that you mentioned it so well. People would sue over anything. And I'm like, really? That's crazy. Yeah, yeah that's true. The, the books are intended solely for amusement and humor, but there is sort of a serious subtext in all of the books, and that is the abuse of the class action system. Class actions serve a, a very legitimate purpose. Think about the uh, Bernie Madoff scandal or airline crashes. Those are very appropriate uses of class action cases. But most of the cases that I play with in my books uh, are cases that really are just a waste of everyone's time, and they really just benefit the lawyers who litigate them. They don't really benefit the clients. They certainly don't benefit the general public. So there is a bit of a serious message in the books. I love how you integrated the social criticism into a satire. Because sometimes it's the easiest way for people to handle the commentary without feeling offended. They're like, that is pretty funny. Mm, he might have a point. <laughs> I need to know. The reading you have and the compost, is that really happening? Do we actually yes. have compost? What? Yeah, yes, yes. There is a human composting. And as Dr. Goodnight said in her testimony, it's legal in five or six states. Now, you're probably wondering, how do I know about composting? of human bodies. One of the great sources for information that I use is the New York Post. I read it every day along with the Wall Street Journal. I read the Wall Street Journal for serious news. The New York Post has a knack for uncovering really amusing things that happen everywhere around the country, including in the courts. And I stumbled across an article about human composting. So everything that Dr. Goodnight said about how it works is absolutely accurate. There really is such a thing, believe it or not. Okay, Mr. Tom, you have me giggling and just dramatized in so many different ways. I also love the fact that you used it in your post as the resource material for your comedy, because most people are like, what, really? That is beautiful. Love it. I think that's amazing. Well, thank you. I'm glad that you giggled and laughed because that's the whole point of the books. Regarding the personal cases that sort of pop up in book one, I did get one a call out in a major media, which is the New York Post, which has a, a large circulation, and they have a Sunday section on books. And the editor of that section ran an article about my prior book, which was called Please Pass the Torts. And in our interview, she asked me the very same question, uh, any of this based on your own cases. And I told her, about one of the cases in book one that literally mirrored one of the cases I handled. And she thought that was absolutely delightful. I love the fact that you're able to take all of your knowledge and experience and turn them into this such an amazing satire for people just to indulge and go and what is going on in the <laughs> world? So love it. Well, that, that's a good point. Life imitating art or art imitating life. The cryptocurrency case that was the subject of the deposition that I read from, that is based on a real life case involving FTX. FTX was the darling of the media and the financial community, and it raked in billions of dollars selling cryptocurrency, and then it had a spectacular decline. It's now in bankruptcy. A lot of people bought cryptocurrency from FTX that is now totally worthless. That story is so bizarre. The story hit just as I was starting to put together this book, Send in the Tort Lawyers, and there were articles on it every day in the New York Post and the Wall Street Journal. 
it, it's so strange. The guy who started the company was a young kid. He was 32 years old, Sam Bankman Freed. He's 32 years old, and his signature attire was sandals, shorts, and a t-shirt and a baseball cap that he wore day in and day out, including the meetings with bankers and financiers. He started up this company, FTX, and generated a huge demand for the firm's cryptocurrency. He and his colleagues lived in a lavish complex in the Bahamas. He had a girlfriend who was like 24, and he made her CEO of a related company. And then the company just went totally bankrupt. And what's interesting about that is I didn't have to invent any weird facts. The facts of that FTX rise and collapse were so bizarre that I could just take them as they were and turn them into the story of one of the cases in this new book. It's amazing how much we forget that every trading company is supposed to be a real company. Like you're supposed to have an actual business, not just this made up thing in the world of stocks. Yeah. Cryptocurrency. I mean, Warren Buffett once said, you might as well put your money in pet rocks. <laughs> it's about the same. It's very much like you <laughs> understand that they're trying to replace money, but you can only use it in this crypto environment. Come on now, guys. Can you buy bread with that? Yeah. Well, what's crazy about it is people invest in crypto not to have it as a medium of exchange. That was its initial purpose. It was a medium of exchange so that people could use it instead of credit cards, but it quickly turned into an, invest in an investment vehicle. Most people buy cryptocurrency because the crypto over time increases in value, and it can be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars for what was initially worth just a few dollars. So people are buying it as an investment. It's beyond me why it's worth what it is because it's not a real thing. We're still not buying actual goods with it. I'm still trying to figure out when am I going to use this thing to buy something that I need, like food. But I might be a little <laughs> old school as well. I'm like, I don't get it, but it's okay. It's not meant for me to get. Yeah, just use your credit card. You're better off. Or just use cash. Or just use the money. It'll be okay. Yeah, right. How long does it take you to put these books together? Because you have 40 years of experience to pull from and never-ending stories coming up every day. How long does it take you, and how do you decide which one to pick? Well, actually, I work fairly fast. I keep a file of clippings from newspapers, the internet, of ideas that might be useful. I would say in mid-November, right before Thanksgiving, I started thinking about this particular book, the next book in the series. And by March, I was finished. For me, the key is figuring out the cases, the events that I want to build the book around. Once I've identified that, then for me, the writing comes pretty easily, like the cryptocurrency. It took me a few weeks to understand what cryptocurrency was and to do some internet research. But once I had all that down, writing up the episodes of the lawsuit, the depositions, and who they're going to sue, that went very quickly because I'm really writing based on my 45 years of experience. How much fun are you having writing these anecdotes as it was going to be presented to a court? Because you know how these dialogues are going back and forth. Are you sitting there giggling like, oh, that would be so much fun to write? Like, what is it going on behind the scenes in your mind? Yeah, I, I do. It drives my wife crazy. I'll, I'll be writing one of these episodes and she comes in and say, what are you laughing about? I'm laughing about the stuff that I'm writing. So the answer is I have a lot of fun. I hope the readers have as much fun. I think many of them have. Some of the comments that have been posted on Amazon say things like, I was frequently laughing out loud or I laughed till I had tears in my eyes. My favorite was a fellow lawyer who wrote that he hadn't laughed so hard since he read Portnoy's complaint. So I, I took that as a very good sign. It is such a great sign. You said it really well at the beginning that sometimes people and lawyers take themselves very seriously. So you have a lot of these experiences that if you're looking at it from a serious perspective, it's delivered very seriously. And the rest of us are going, you know, it's a little nuts. Like, why are we doing this? So <laughs> love the take. So tell us, what are you working on now? Is the next book getting ready to be coming out soon? No, I'm pretty busy right now doing interviews and podcasts and writing articles. Uh, this 
new book comes out in mid-September. I am planning, of course, a fourth book in the series, and I'm at the behest of the computer expert who helps me with all things computer related. He thinks that I should focus the next book on artificial intelligence. And the more I thought about it, the more I think that's a great idea. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on in the AI world. Just for example, <laughs> a, an AI lawyer made the list of the best hundred lawyers in the US. So what? there's, yes, and lawyers are using AI to generate briefs. And there was a recent court case in New York where the judge sanctioned the attorney because the brief turned out all of these phony cases that had nothing to do with the real case that was on trial. And yet they were submitted in the brief by one of the parties. So there's a lot of amusing stuff that will be a crossover between AI and the legal world. So that will almost certainly be part of the focus of the next book in the series. Hey, Mr. Tom, I thought the writing community was having issues with AI, people trying to write novels this way. But the fact that lawyers are trying to present it in a court of justice, <laughs> like, this is some facts I'm going to use is like, really? Yeah, it's like, crazy. <laughs> are they using Wikipedia to do the research too? Like, what are you using? Like, what is going on here? <laughs> you have plenty of material to pull from and have a blast. So to our listeners, by the time you're listening to this, the book has been released, so you need to check it out because it's already available and is going to be absolutely fabulous. So this is Tom, question for you as a retired lawyer and have a lot of experience and been writing for a while now, what advice would you give to an up-and-coming author who's like, I want to pull from my experience to actually do this? Well, I'm not sure I'm the one to lecture up aspiring writers, but the one thing I learned was you really need to write about something you know about. When I wrote the spy novel, as I said, I had read spy novels and watched spy stories on television in the movies, but I didn't really know anything in detail about it. But I spent 45 years in the modern American litigation, trying cases, arguing appeals around the country. So I really knew about that. And that made the whole process easy. And it was just a matter of figuring out, do I want to write a serious book about law or a thriller or a satire? And of course, I chose satire. So stick to something that you really know about and that you can bring your knowledge and life experience to bear on what it is that you're writing. Great advice. And to our listeners, if you're interested in writing a novel, just think about something you enjoy, and then you can give it that fun original spin to the things that you got bringing to the situation. So I love it. So Mr. Tom, where can our listeners find you when they can learn more about the books, where they can get more information? Tell us. Well, my website is Torts R, the letter R, T-O-R-T-S-R-Us, Torts R Us book.com. There's a lot of stuff on the website about the first two books in the series and we're starting to put up material about the third book. The book should be available on Amazon, and I have an Amazon page, the citation of which has about 85 <laughs> letters and numerals. I wouldn't try to give that in an interview. And my website would also have a link to Amazon, so that would be the easy way to get to Amazon, torchrsbook.com. I love the title of your website. All I can think is like Toys R Us, like such a clever name. Nice job. Love it. Thank you. So to our listeners, make sure you sign up for the newsletter. Make sure you follow Mr. Tom. You're going to love these books. They're absolutely hysterical. I'm sitting here thinking of Christmas presents. I'm like, ooh, who can I give this for a person <laughs> that is going to enjoy it as much as I am? Mr. Tom, before you leave us, are you ready for the lightning round? Uh, yeah, I hope I can uh, think as quickly as you ask. <laughs> super super easy i promise let's do this coffee or tea coffee nice sweet or sour sweet science fiction or drama oh drama i really don't like science fiction at all okay cats or dogs dogs okay i had a so cat once. drove me crazy <laughs> I can see you as a dog person. Here's a little different. If you could play any character in a film, who will you play? Oh, I would love to play the role of Chip. Chip Pierpoint, who's a character in all three books. He's an associate at the firm of Peters and Peters. 
and uh, he's a very handsome guy. He was a star quarterback at Dartmouth. He's not a great lawyer, but his claim to fame is that he never meets a woman that he hasn't vetted. And so his ongoing sexual exploits are featured in all the books. And several of my male friends who've read the books said, if there's a, a second life, they want to come back as Chip. It seems he must be doing well because nobody's trying to kill him for that. So I am impressed. <laughs> Mr. Tom, it has been such a pleasure having you. Do you have any closing remarks for us? I would just say simply, if someone is looking for a good laugh, I would recommend you check out these books. And by the way, their appeal isn't limited to lawyers. Lots of people who are not lawyers had read them and loved them. A lady that we know in England has an elderly mother and she had her mother buy the book, and her mother just loved it. So you don't have to be a lawyer to enjoy the books. You just have to be willing to enjoy a good laugh and try not to fall off your chair because you're laughing too hard. Oh, and you guys have to remember that reading was fabulous. <laughs> so yes, go ahead, pick up the books. Mrs. Tom, a pleasure. Thank you, and congratulations on the release. We're doing a happy dance for you. Absolutely ecstatic. Let us know when the next one comes out. If you're interested in joining us again, we would love to have you back. Thank you so much, DC. A pleasure. To our listeners, go ahead, join the community, sign up for Mr. Tom's website, his newsletter, make sure you join him. And also go ahead, give us a like, share this podcast with your friends. Know that we're better when we're growing together. And we'll see you back next week for another amazing episode.